All right, how's it going, y'all? Today we're gonna to be doing a buying guide for TrueNAS Core, which is the update from FreeNAS. So pretty much what this is, is a NAS operating system that's totally open source, and it also is based off of ZFS. ZFS is built into the core of TrueNAS, and so if you're running TrueNAS, you have to be using ZFS for its file system. And so because of that, it's actually a little bit more particular about what kind of hard drives you use and how your entire configuration is. And so that's why it's kind of important to have a buying guide for buying your own system for this. And this right here is my ZFS TrueNAS server, which for most people, and honestly for myself, is complete and total overkill, but it does have a lot of things in it and I can run whatever I want on top of here and still have as much performance as I could possibly need. And so ZFS is actually a very special file system that has some awesome attributes like copy on write, snapshots, and be able to send snapshots over the network all while being very space efficient. It's got built-in compression and one of the best caching algorithms for RAM. And so that means you can get incredible performance out of it or you can also get terrible performance out of it. It's very dependent on how your setup is and making sure everything works right. For a regular file system, you're probably gonna run it in ext4, and it's just gonna work. It's gonna work about the speed of the hard drives that are underneath it, and you can use a RAID controller, you can use software RAID, you can really do whatever you like to it, and you're gonna probably get pretty good performance out of it, and that's pretty much all there is to it. But with ZFS, there is a ton of stuff you can do, and it can really make or break your system. And so right now, this is an R630 that I've been using, and it's got seven SSDs in there that are all one terabyte, and they are in a RAID Z1 array. Think of RAID Z1 kind of similar to RAID 5, where pretty much one disk can fail, and I can rebuild that. Note, it is actually quite different than RAID 5 once you look under the hood, and it's actually not as space efficient as RAID 5. If you're actually writing a ton of really small files, which not a lot of workflows do, but virtualization can do depending on how you're set up, it can actually be very space inefficient compared to what you would expect out of RAID 5. And I'm not gonna go over that here. That needs to be its own video, but just don't expect to have 100% the exact same storage that you would out of RAID 5. But for now, we can think of it as more or less the same. And at worst, you should expect to get maybe 10 to 20% less storage for average users. There's forum posts, I'll leave an article below, but that is subject to change. And so the important thing about this is you do not want a RAID controller in between your disks and your motherboard because your CPU ZFS needs to have control over every single individual disk as if it was just plugged directly into the system. Now that also holds true. You do not wanna just use USB hard drives on here. If you wanna set up a USB hard drive RAID system, look at another operating system because TrueNAS is just not designed for that and you're just gonna run into issues and absolutely blow away any advantage you get out of ZFS. It's just not what you wanna do. So when you're looking at a RAID controller, and specifically this is a pre-built R630 server from Dell, and so it's got a RAID controller built in. However, this RAID controller I've selected is not actually a RAID controller. It is an HBA330, a host bus adapter. And so that is what you want. Pretty much what a host bus adapter is, it's just a SAS to PCIe converter, and so it's just directly passing in the disks directly into ZFS, so it has total control over them, and that's really what you want. For the hard drives, normal rules apply. If you get an SSD, you're gonna get much better IOPS. The only thing you really need to make sure when you're buying hard drives specifically is you cannot be buying SMR drives. That is shingled magnetic RAID. So most other file systems will be fine with it. ZFS can freak out and actually cause a lot of corruption and literally year long rebuild times because of the way those drives work. So you really don't wanna be buying SMR drives. The only NAS drives that are SMR right now are the WD standard ones that are below four terabytes, I believe. So just make sure whatever hard drive you're getting is not SMR. You really need to make sure that's true because ZFS can cause huge issues when you go to rebuild the file system. And so also in this video, I'm not gonna go over too much about the different VDEV types you've got. So pretty much you either have mirrored or RAID Z. You can also have just a single disc, but that's gonna be for a whole nother video. 
Really, what you got is you just want to choose those. And for regular home users, you probably want RAID Z1, RAID Z2. There's also RAID Z3 if you're really concerned about it, but that's also a very large overhead for you. And for a lot of workflows, that's probably not worth it. And so the other really cool thing about ZFS, which in my opinion makes it an awesome file system, is the fact that you can actually just expand the file system by adding another RAID Z1 pool next to it. So say I had four drives in a RAID Z1 array, basically I would have three drives of storage, more or less. If I wanted to expand it, I could actually just go through, add four more drives next to it, and build another RAID Z1 array. Now, it does mean you have to expand in chunks. So that means that if you are using eight drives at a time, you have to add in eight drives at a time next to each other to expand outward. That is the one thing about ZFS, you can't just expand it. That is in work, but as of today, you can't go through and change a RAID Z1 array with four hard drives to a RAID Z1 array with five hard drives without blowing it away and rebuilding. But what that does mean you can do is you can stick them next to each other and you get incredibly fast performance because you just get to stack these together. You don't have the IOP limitations of having a massive RAID 6 array. Instead, you have a bunch of RAID Z1 arrays next to each other, which means your IOPs really increase. And so that's a cool feature of ZFS. And so with all that out of the way, we need to talk about the specific upgrades you're probably going to want to do to get good performance. ZFS loves RAM. There's a rule of thumb that it's one gigabyte of RAM per terabyte. Really, it's all very fluctuating depending on how fast you need to go and how often you're accessing files and what kind of server it is. But in general, I would start off with at least 16 gigs of RAM to get good performance. And then that's probably good for you for up to probably 10 terabytes. And then from there, you're just going to want to increase your RAM as you increase your storage. Realistically, it's not like you're going to get absolutely terrible performance out of ZFS if you have a little bit too much RAM, but it is going to be once you're reaching those limits, you're going to need more and more RAM as you're increasing your file system more and more. That totally depends on your workflows though, and it's hard to tell, but I would just say start off with 16 gigabytes, and that's probably good for 10 terabytes, maybe even 20 depending on your workflow, and then just add RAM as you see fit. More RAM is always going to equal more performance, because of a really cool feature of ZFS where it's got a very intelligent caching algorithm for the actual file system. So instead of the standard least recently used file system, so pretty much any file that's been recently used is kept in RAM until another file gets added into RAM and then the last thing added gets kicked out. That is incredibly inefficient because as soon as you go through and do a backup or anything like that, all of a sudden it blows away all that cache. And that's also true if you have an SSD cache in other file systems. With ZFS, it actually uses not only how recently it was added, but also how often it was kicked out of the RAM cache and then brought back in. And so if it gets kicked out and brought back in, then it gets harder and harder to kick out every single time that happens. And because of that, you can end up getting 90% cache hit rates for ZFS which means you're reading from RAM, and that means especially for hard drives where you've got very slow spinning disks and a lot of users connected in, you can get really good performance out of it without having to go SSDs. Then the other thing that ZFS has is what's called L2 Arc. Now, a lot of forum posts you're gonna read are gonna say that you don't need Layer 2 Arc. Pretty much what that is, is an SSD that you use as a RAM cache, just a little bit slower. And so the ARC is the actual memory cache that is in RAM. And then the layer two ARC is the storage cache that is instead of in RAM, it is in a physical media. Generally, you'd want a very fast SSD. So in the past, that was a SATA SSD. The problem with SATA SSDs is they're limited to the SATA bus, which is about 550 megabytes per second. So they're actually quite slow compared to RAM and also what a RAID can do when you're accessing files in parallel. And so in the past, you actually didn't really want all your streams coming from the SATA SSD because it would actually be slower overall than probably your RAID pool in sequential reads. The thing is now, there's something called NVMe SSDs. NVMe SSDs not only have way better IOPS, which is basically operations per second that the SSD can do, but they also have insanely fast transfer speeds. Three gigabytes per second, you can see, 
with a very fast one, easily reliable two gigabytes per second. And so because of that, having an NVMe SSD is actually a huge advantage for a lot more workflows than it used to be when you had a layer two SSD that was just a SATA hard drive. And so in reality today, because of these insanely fast NVMe SSDs, if you have mechanical hard drives as the storage pool, getting a NVMe SSD as an L2 ARC cache for the pool can give you huge performance benefits, as long as you have enough RAM. That's because anything that's actually put in the NVMe cache, the L2 ARC, has to be indexed within the RAM. And so it has to have an entry for every single one of those kept in RAM. And so just make sure you're not super low on RAM and you'll be able to have really great performance. I'll leave an article that talks about this, that they did a great study on it. And they've really shown that now with the NVMe SSD, L2 Arc is so much more powerful than it was just five years ago with the SATA SSD. And so that's my two cents. It's not required obviously, but if you want really fast IOPS from mechanical hard drives, it's actually a great thing to look at. Now the other type of special storage pool that you've got is a S-Log. And S-Log stands for secondary log device. And pretty much what that allows you to do is stream any writes to it that need to be synchronous writes. And so a synchronous write is when the operating system says, hey, before you do anything else, make sure that this is written to disk before I will send you anything else. That way it knows that if the power gets lost, that data has been written to disk and you're not going to get a corrupt file system. And so if you're doing a ton of synchronous writes on spinning disk, it's going to be very slow. So to alleviate that, instead you can write them to what's called an S-log. An S-log pretty much is a very fast SSD that just keeps getting those streaming writes to it. And so that way ZFS can say, okay, yes, those are protected. Those are written to the file system. If the power goes out, we are going to be okay. Now, because of that, you need to make sure that whatever SSD you're using has power loss protection. Because if the SSD doesn't have power loss protection and the power goes out and the entire thing crashes, when you boot it back up, it's not gonna have the data in there, therefore useless. The other thing that's often a misconception about the S-Log is, is the S-Log actually never gets read from unless there's a power outage or a crash or something like that that causes an unexpected power outage. If that happens, all that ZFS does on boot is it reads anything that's in that S-Log and writes them to the disk. Normally, instead what it would do on regular use is it'll stream all those synchronous writes and write them to that S-Log. Then it'll wait until it's the right time, normally about under five seconds, to write the actual data. It'll keep it in RAM and then write it to the disk. That way you don't have a ton of chopped up data on your hard drives because ZFS just keeps writing to wherever the disks are. Instead, it gets to go through, collect all its writes into a nice big tunnel and send everything in a lot more efficiently. The S-Log is just there in case there's an unexpected shutdown or anything like that and stuff that is kept in the RAM that's said to be written soon will be able to be recovered. And so it's the only time you use an S-Log but honestly, for most people, an S-Log is overkill, unless you're running virtual machines. So if you're just using it as an SMB share, what I would recommend doing is just turn off synchronous writes on that SMB share. What this will mean is you might lose data on an unexpected crash or power outage from the last five seconds. But for most people, the rare times that, that might happen and you happen to be writing data, it's probably already on your hard drive or somewhere else, and it's not going to absolutely kill you. ZFS snapshots, if you're using them, will make sure that you don't lose data and you've got an old copy of that. So really, I would recommend not going for that and instead just getting a UPS, which will work much better for you and you don't have the complexity of having an S-Log. But overall, that's the other option for a special VDEV. Now for CPUs, it really does not matter too much. Just make sure you've got something somewhat modern and specifically, you need to make sure it is an x86 architecture. I wouldn't recommend throwing an ARM system in here. It might work, you might be able to get it to work, but it's just not gonna be optimized for that and you're gonna run into some issues. And so really, CPU does not matter too much. The faster it is, the faster Samba can be, because Samba generally uses single threads for most of its operations, and so you're generally clock speed bound from Samba. So Samba is what runs SMB, and so that's how you're generally gonna be accessing your files through Windows and Mac OS. And so really, that doesn't matter too much. And finally, the network card. 
The network card is going to be what makes or breaks your NAS from most people's use cases. So if you have a one gigabit connection on this, you're going to be limited to no matter how fast this is to 125 megabytes per second read and write speeds from this unit. But if you go up to a 10 gig card, you can easily squeeze out one gigabyte per second based on that connection. And so you really wanna look at having a 10 gig card if you want higher performance out of your true NAS box. But if you're just using it as a virtual machine backend and you're just doing really, really, really fast read and writes that require a lot of IOPS but not a lot of throughput, maybe you're fine with one gig or it just depends on your use case. This right here is overkill for most people. You can really just take any old used computer that you've had from a few years ago and start just throwing three and a half inch hard drives in there and be able to have a great performing NAS using true NAS. So it's really whatever you make it and you can bring your own hardware. And that is the real advantage of these systems. Go ahead and leave any of the tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below and have a good one. Bye.